Thank you, Zeritza. I'll lead off now. Insects in a drought breaking year. It's really been an incredible summer, early drought, bushfires, no planting rains uh, till February, and then a literal explosion of insect species. Uh, there were moth plagues, and that's a common phenomena in drought years. Uh, we Often you get army worm out, massive army worm outbreaks following the breaking of a drought, so it's a period where it should all be uh, on our guard. Of course, there were the normal... Uh, actors on the scene, mirrored Healy's podsuckers and some of the more crop specific ones such as crown borer and soybean. So they came into the later plantings. Phytoplasma was fortunately low and that's probably because there were very few vectors and few hosts in the early summer period. So one benefit of the drought. Um, on everyone's mind was, was Healy coverpa resistant. So even though they had late plantings, they did get late healies, and they're worried about it in future seasons. On average, Alicor worked very well, and, and it's got good residual activity, three weeks plus. Uh, some reports of steward being less than perfect, and those were mostly linked to poor spray coverage, so poor nozzle selection, using air induction nozzles, old nozzles coupled with low spray volumes. Uh, so we'd be urging all growers and consultants to use the GRDC nozzle chart because we want a space spect droplet spectrum of fine mediums. Um, and one of the issues is we can't just rely on the two insecticide groups, Aldercore and Steward. We really need to use a firm war and success NEO when and if the price comes down. Uh, all these are ingestion products, and moribund larvae do trick people. Uh, they look as though they're alive, but in fact, they've stopped speeding, feeding. Um, Meetings in Queensland, we've suggested that people consider uh, virus, NPV, for Healy's uh, and consider chemigation if they're an irrigated system because that will get the, uh, the product out there with very good spray coverage and also at no application cost. Also, we need to emphasise the need for soft options for other pests such as mirrored softer options to conserve the Healy uh, beneficials. So this is some data and images that Molina's group produced, and you can see a firm there, and those larvae are moribund. They've stopped feeding. They will die within about three days. But you can see they look very similar to the uh, healthy larvae in the untreated control. There's a little test people can do themselves, and that's the take-home test. Collect those larvae from the treated uh, crop, take them, put them in a jar, get some leaves or foliage flowers from the top of the crop that would have received the spray and leave them overnight and see what happens. And if there's none or very little feeding, they're moribund. However, if they're healthy, then we do need to worry. Um, this next slide leads us into the control of pets other than Healy's. So the timing of first spraying is always a contentious issue. Uh, and people say to me, why delay the first spray? And I say, well, to reduce the number of mirrored sprays uh, and to reduce the risk of flaring healies. And of course, the question comes up, can we delay that first mirrored spray without producing yield? And we do, We know dimethoid at the full registered rate, that's why we recommend the half rate, but to read it, dimethoid at the full rate increases the risk of flaring heligoverpa. And here's some data here. So you can see, the red line is the threshold line at the time. The blue line is the Healy population following the dimethoate spray. And the green line is the untreated control. And you can see that just one dimethoate spray within a week brought your Healy's to over, over threshold. But if you didn't have the with and without comparison, you wouldn't know what was happening. And this graph illustrates what many consultants call the Healy treadmill pattern. So as soon as you start saying for mirrors, often within seven to 10 days, you will have Healy's. So just something to be aware of, and that's been the impetus for the look for softer products to control Healy's. Um, this is some data from back when, but we set a, a trial up specifically to look at this timing of the first mirrored spray. So we had four cohorts of plots that were sprayed progressively later at weekly intervals. And this, 
was compared to the control. So the population was quite high in this crop. It was started out about 2.5 mirrors per square metre at early flowering and peaked at over four. If the people who say spraying, delaying a week will reduce your yield are true, then the W2 yield by default must be markedly lower than the W1 yield. And yet that didn't happen. The longer we delayed, however, the progressively lower the yield got. But you can see you do have that latitude there. And so the question, yeah, the data clearly shows in this case it may be a high yielding, well growing crop, but certainly that popula starting population was well above threshold and yet delaying a yield, uh, delaying that first spray had no impact on the yield. So we would recommend that timing we would say timing is, is one of the strategies we need to use to, in the, uh, to combat healing resistance to reduce that flaring. Seedling thrips uh, weren't an issue this year, mainly in spring crops because we didn't have any spring mung beans, but maybe next season we will. Uh, but as in cotton, really worth spraying. Uh, on the left there, you can see a severely damaged crop. That was the worst damage I'd ever seen. Uh, in that crop, the grower did spray. Uh, but you can see there three weeks later, there's no difference between unsprayed and sprayed strips. Now, fortunately, this grower left unsprayed strips. So if in a situation you're unsure of, uh, have the courage to leave unsprayed strips because that's the only way you'll convince yourself that spraying or not spraying is worth it. So it was a very useful exercise. The North Coast um, Soybeans is their dominant uh, summer pulse. Uh, they had late plantings. Normally you would expect late uh, plantings to have fewer crown borers, but it, there were quite high numbers in some of the late crops. Uh, so growers are probably more likely to tr seed treat uh, or in furrow with fipronol. Not the nicest of chemicals, but it's been the only chemical to control this pest, which can uh, slash yields in some badly affected crops by 50 or 60 percent. Uh, however, for the management of this, we would still recommend that people uh, pupa bust. So with GPS steering, you can go down the rows where the stubble is and just a narrow strip, uh, smash those stems, bury them so you don't get uh, larva surviving into the next summer's uh, crop. In much the same way that Melinda is recommending that strategy for scarabs in, in some summer crops. Um, there have been questions uh, about the impact of fipronol on predator, predators. So in this trial here, we were looking at fipronol. We also threw cruiser in. So cruiser is a different group of uh, chemicals with one of the neonics, uh, but similarly, uh, similar properties to fipronol. You can see there that there was a slight impact on predatory beetles, what is significant, uh, and no impact on predatory bugs. And that was for legion, whereas cruiser had a significant impact on, on both those uh, beneficial groups. The other question that people ask is, what's the impact on nodulation and yield? And the data showed a uh, slight impact on nodulation, but no impact at all on yield. Um, there have been some reports from the Glen Innes area. Uh, Rachel O'Neill uh, mentioned that to me that they thought they had reduced germination or less figure from treated seed. Uh, something we need to look at more, it may be because of the uh, interval between the treating of the seed and planting, we're not sure. Other point I'd make too is that this uh, trial uh, was had very low infestation rates with crown borer, less than 0.5% infested. And so any impacts on yield was not due to the crown borer. There was no confounding effect from that. I'd also mention too that we didn't have any thrips data here. Uh, Thripanol has been linked overseas to taking out thrips populations. And if that happens, that can increase the risk of mite attack. We haven't seen that to date, but something to watch. Uh, soybean aphids were another problem on the uh, coast. Um, we do have a permit for that, that is much softer and beneficial, and so we'll keep ladybirds in the system. Um, and soybean aphid, I just would mention they can't be ignored because if they get away post uh, early potting, uh, your crop will become very uneven at harvest. Uh, it won't be harvest ready. So you can see on the right-hand side there, the crop with a 
the headland ends weren't sprayed deliberately and you can see the rest of the crop is harvest ready and, and the crop in the foreground is anything but soybean stem fly has been a pest in recent years in the north coast uh, look for the exit holes distinctive exit holes uh, that's the first giveaway uh, impact very bad in 2013 but we think that impact was confounded by charcoal rot uh, because in 2018 there was an impact with similar levels of infection, about four to six larvae per plant, uh, in the same cultivar, uh, but no uh, no impact on harvest maturity or plant death. Or, so, but keep an eye out on this one and please report any future outbreaks. Managing healies, it has to be a multi-pest approach, not just focusing on heliogabapamate, a more systems approach. Uh, please report any unusual pest outbreaks uh, and we need to document them for the next generation of consultants and researchers. And thank you to GRDC for funding our uh, Northern Grains, RD&E over recent years.